So I'd like to welcome you to a lecture series on applied and computational math that we put together uh, this week. Our speaker is Dennis M. Wilson, who is one of the world's foremost experts on the field of spherical integral geometry. Um, now, it should be said there aren't that many people who work in this area <laughs> yet, but um, we found that this is beautiful and phenomenally useful material. And so we're really excited to have Dennis out here to explain some of the basics um, of the area and how he's applied it in his own work. He studied it on the University of Paderborn and has done postdocs at uh, Oxford, Cornell, and the INA. And um, is there a next stage yet in the development? Well, I guess. All right. So for now, he's uh, at Cornell working with Jim Renniger, who's a well-known expert in uh, complex optimization. Dennis. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thanks for the invitation and thank you all for coming. Um, yeah, so these three talks will be about the intrinsic volumes of uh, circular intrinsic volumes or intrinsic volumes of complex cones. And yeah, this, the first one is really uh, just an introduction and um, to give you an idea how these um, intrinsic volumes can be applied. Uh, uh, well, I will present this modification, which is actually quite nice and gives the first uh, glimpse of uh, how powerful these uh, intrinsic volumes can be, can be used. So, we're going to, um, well, we have actually three questions that we want to tackle. So first of all, what are intrinsic volumes? This is basically the uh, topic of this talk. And then, why are they useful? Um, so I will talk today uh, just a little about kinematic formulas, but we will see them again in the second talk. And then what's the state of the art? Uh, well, it's basically the second and the third talk that uh, is going to address these uh, other two questions. But first of all, what are intrinsic volumes? And uh, right, so, just to give you a first uh, overview of, uh, of this talk. So I'll start with a little spoiler because there's a really nice and, and quick way to, to explain what intrinsic volumes are for polyhedral cones. But, uh, so this is a really nice um, uh, characterization and it's actually when I'm, when I'm, when I'm asked uh, what intrinsic volumes of um, cone, uh, uh, convex cones are, then it's basically this um, definition that I will give. But this sort of hides all the uh, classical material which is there on the Euclidean case, and so uh, once we've uh, seen this definition, we'll go back to the Euclidean case and then sort of uh, present the, uh, a classical, um, the classical intrinsic volumes and how they transfer to the spherical case, and then we come back to this uh, case of polyhedral cones. And then, well, at the end, I will give you a small, uh, uh, small application, which is a simple threshold phenomenon which can be deduced very quickly from this uh, kinematic cones and from the uh, cones, uh, circular cones. But really, uh, more about that uh, later. So let's start with a little spoiler that I have uh, here. So, well, first of all, a convex cone, just to make sure that everyone's on, on the same page. So, a convex cone is just a, a set which is scaling invariant and uh, convex at the same time. And uh, so, the dual cone is just a set of all um, linear functions which are. Uh, Non-positive. So my, some of them, uh, some some people call this a polar cone, but I prefer to call this a dual cone. But anyways, it's just um, just as, as a naming. And well, what's a polyhedral cone? The polyhedral cone is basically the intersection of finitely many half spaces, so linear half spaces. Right. So, uh, so let's uh, look at this uh, picture. So here we have uh, uh, one uh, inequality which defines a uh, uh, half space. And then if we intersect with the uh, second one, then we can call this a uh, convex cone C. And uh, as you see, the dual cone defined in this way lies down here. And uh, so this is basically my setting that I'm working with. Um, so by the way, if there's any question at any time, just feel free to, to ask. We have plenty of time to address any questions. OK. So now, um, any point of view, um, any polyhedral convex uh, uh, set, or in particular any polyhedral convex cone, can be decomposed uh, in terms of its faces. So what's a face of a cone? Um, so a face is just the intersection of the cone C with a, a linear hyperplane defined by some vector from the, from the dual cone. And uh, by the way, so the zero vector is always uh, part of the dual cone. So in particular, the, the cone C itself is also considered as a face. Right? And so um, let's uh, see it, uh, this cone C here. Um, 
So if you find calligraphic f, f as the relative interiors of all its faces, then we have a disjoint composition of this convex cones here. Well, let's look at this picture here. So we have a two-dimensional set here, which is just the uh, interior of the cones here itself. And then we have uh, some one-dimensional rays. So this is basically a uh, half rays. And then we have the uh, origin itself. And so these form a disjoint decomposition of the polyhedral cone. Right? So and yeah, so now every every one of these faces has a certain dimension. So let's say that the calligraphic FJ is just the, uh, so the, the set of all relative interiors of the J-dimensional faces, and then we can um, we, we can define the function d from C to uh, set of uh, zero to to n, which just gives us the dimension of the point relative. So if I take a point from the interior, then then d of this point would be 2, so here it would be 1, and here it would be 0. Right. Excuse me, what yeah. is f bar? So f bar is just a phase of C. So here we have uh, the two dimensional phase. So uh, one element would be the, the interior of the cone C. Right. So f bar could be one of those uh, rays. The relative interior would be this uh, half ray, or it could be the origin itself. So, so the faces are just intersections of the cone with the with the with the hyperplane. So if we okay, let's let's make this. Clear. So if you have a cone, uh, can you see? Right. So if you have a cone C here, then you have the dual cone down here. So this is the cone C. The dual cone would be down here. Now I take a. a so let's take the this. So let's take the vector v here. Then the the, the hyperplane defined by v is oops, it's intersected with C surfaces. Okay. Right, and this way we get this decomposition of the. And then higher dimensions, of course, we we get higher dimensional pieces and higher dimensional. In your definition of phase, you don't really need the qualification that V is in the dual cone, right? Because any V that makes that linear function zero no, will no, have no. to be in the dual cone. No, no, no. If you take a point outside, then you would get a, a ray in the, in the interior of C. Right. So we really need that uh, we have the dual cone. So we need a supporting hyperplane. Yeah. Any more questions? So, so this is sort of essential to the theory, so it's good to understand what's on this slide. Right, but now we have this uh, function d, which goes from the from the, uh, from the cone c itself to this um, well, to the set of uh, numbers. And uh, okay, now this is a, a convex set, and every convex set comes uh, with a projection map, uh, map. So, if you take a point x down here, then the projection is just the uh, next point in the cone C, right? And so now we can uh, combine the projection with the with the uh, map D, and uh, so this gives us the decomposition of the of the space. So, uh, okay, and this basically defines us the uh, intrinsic volumes, right? So let's see. So for for J is now just an index between zero and n. We can characterize the J intrinsic volume of C. Remember that C is a polyhedral cone in the following way. So we pick a point P uniformly random on the unit sphere, or you could also uh, think of P being chosen um, in the Euclidean space uh, Rn um, by a standard normal distribution. And now we project this point on the cone C, and then we ask in which dimension of the phase does it land. And the probability that I land in a g-dimensional phase is just the j intrinsic one. So if you, if you look at this picture here, then you see you have the cone C over here. So well, if you project the point from here on, on the cone C, then it's just the point C itself. And the dimension is, of course, 2 because it lies in the interior of C. So if I take a point here, then it, if I project it, then I land in a one-dimensional phase. Right? So the points here, uh, D uh, composed with P pi is just 1. And here the dual cone is just 0. 
so this is the characterization of uh, the intrinsic avoidance for polyhedral cones. And uh, I should mention at this point that this characterization doesn't hold for more general cones. So we are also interested in, say, the cone of positive semi-definite matrices. And this is not polyhedral. So to, to cover the more general case of a convex cone, we cannot use this in the uh, characterization. But this is a very good starting point to, to, get, a, to get an idea of what these intrinsic points are. All right, so let's look at some, some elementary properties of these intrinsic moments that you can uh, deduce from this characterization. So first of all, there are non-negative numbers, right? So these are just probabilities, and so these are all non-negative numbers. And we also see that they add up to 1. Right. Okay, let's go back to this. So, um, so I, I take this uh, the composition of the, of the projection and then this uh, map D. And so this gives us a decomposition of the of the Euclidean space, and well, each point is mapped somewhere, and so all these probabilities add up to one. Right. So this is a nice observation, and what's also very useful to to uh, look at is the what I call the volume polynomial of C. So let's take these intrinsic volumes and well form a formal polynomial of it. Right. So this x is not just a, a formal variable. And so, well, for, for me, it's just a, um, a useful tool to, to uh, write down uh, certain, certain properties of intrinsic volumes. And one very nice property is the following. If you take uh, the direct product of two codes, say C and D, and then we ask about the volume polynomial of the direct product, then it turns out that the volume polynomial is, in fact, just the, poly the product of the two uh, uh, volume polynomials. So what does it mean for the intrinsic volumes? This means that the intrinsic volumes of the direct product arises the convolution of the intrinsic volumes of the two parts. Right. So I mean, I don't, I, I won't sketch the proof, but it's uh, using this characterization that I showed you before. You just have to look at um, these maps um, d uh, composed with the projection, and well, the, the projection is now well, if, if you have a product, then the projection is just the projector of each component, and then you can look at the dimension. The dimension is additive, and then this gives you the conclusion. So this is so. Uh, it's, it's not very hard to actually show this. Right, but well, okay. Uh, now we can use this formula to, to look at a very nice but very important example. It's the positive orthon. Right? So the positive orthon is just a set of vectors which have all uh, non-negative uh, components, and uh, this is a direct product. This is just a direct product of a single rays. And so now what's the uh, volume polynomial of this positive orthon? Well, applying the, um, the, the, the formula that I've given, it's just a product. Uh, it's just, uh, well, it just the, the n times product of the uh, volume polynomial of, um, of a single ray. So now you see this is a one-dimensional cone. Now what are the intrinsic forms of the one-dimensional cone? This is one half, one half. So if you insert this in, in this formula, it's just 1 half, 1 plus x to the n, right? And if you expand this, then you see that we actually get the symmetric binomial distribution as intrinsic bonds of the first part. Right, and this is actually what I, um, what's my picture of the intrinsic bonds. For me, it's um, a certain discrete distribution on the set of indices from zero to the, to the dimension of the cone, which somehow um, codes certain statistical properties of the cone. So this is a, it's a vague statement, but you will see um, the, uh, it's very concrete in, in the kinematic formulas. So the kinematic formulas somehow uh, show us how the intrinsic volumes actually capture certain statistics of the cone. OK, so this is the little spoiler that I, I wanted to show you, because now, um, OK, so, so now we have a sort of very nice characterization of polyhedral cones, but we're interested in more complicated cones, like the cone of positive semi-definite matrices, right? But to understand that, you, you cannot use the, well, you could use these characterizations before, but this is sort of, this is not very helpful. If you want to compute certain things, then you cannot use this, um, I the, this polyhedral characterization. So we have to go, go back and actually look at the Euclidean case to get the full picture. So let's look at the Euclidean case. Um, well, first of all, 
to make sure everyone uh, knows what we're talking about. A convex body is, for me, a, just a bounded closed convex set. And uh, so I also include the empty set just to, uh, well, some, uh, it's, 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 some prefer to, to exclude the empty set, or some assume that it has to be full dimensional. But for me, it's just a uh, convex compact, a uh, compact convex set. So the, an important not, uh, um, notation is a, is a tube around a, a convex body. So what is a tube? Is the tube is just the set of those points which lie in a um, distance at most r from the uh, convex body k itself. So we uh, see a picture on the next slide. The uh, here is for you. Sorry. The e here is for you. Yeah. The, right. So later on we will uh, look at uh, spherical tubes, and that's why. To the E here to make sure that this is actually the clear distance. Okay, now let's look at a two dimensional example. So, the classical theorem of Steiner is the following. If we look at the volume of the tube of a convex body, then we basically have the polynomial in the radius. Okay, let's look at the picture because this shows you exactly that this must be true. So, here's our convex body K. So now let's look at the tube of, well, radius r around the point uh, body k. It looks like this. Now we can decompose this tube, right, this way. And okay, let's let's rearrange these parts around here, and then we get this. So now let's look at the volume. So if you look at the volume of the tube of this uh, convex body, then you see that we have some something constant, right? Just the volume of the set k itself. Then we have something linear, right? And then we have a quadratic term. And the quadratic term is actually just, it's, it's always a fullness. Right? So you see that we get this formula over here. Right? Now it's, well, I think in a two dimensional case, it's really, uh, that's how we can actually prove that it is true. But um, this also holds in, in general n dimensions, right? So the general case says that. If you look at the tube of a Euclidean convex body um, K, then this is a polynomial um, in the radius. Right? But to, to define this intrinsic volumes, so here you can see that each A will be the intrinsic volumes, to define this uh, in a nice way, we, we don't take the monomials itself, but we take the volume of um, n minus uh, of n minus J dimensional um, dots of radius R. So this is of order r to the n minus j, but it has some normalizing coefficients, and this defines the intrinsic problems in the right way. So, so just think of it in, in, as if um, these were, in, in fact, monomials, right? OK, and this, this the definition of the Euclidean intrinsic volumes is just uh, the coefficients arising in this uh, volume form. OK? All right, so let's look at some um, special cases. Well, we've seen this already. So what's Vn of k? Vn of k, if you look at this here, then we uh, have the volume of a zero-dimensional ball, which is just a constant, constant 1. So Vn of k is just the volume of k. Right. And now, so what's V0 of k? Well, V0 of k, then we have here the volume of a r-dimensional ball. And you've seen before that all these uh, um, quadratic terms in the two-dimensional case form the um, a disk of radius r, and this is also true for, for n dimensions. Right? So the zero, the zero intrinsic volume is just, well, it's one if, if k is uh, non empty, and it's zero by definition if k is empty. Yeah. yeah. So I, I guess yeah, it's, it's, uh, one would expect this, but is it easy to show that this definition is consistent for polyhedral columns? Well, I mean, this only holds for, for uh, um, compact sets, so this doesn't hold for any. Um, oh, I see. This has been on, but... So this, uh, the reason why we have to change, so this this Euclidean uh, theory doesn't apply to convex cones. So if you want to consider cones, then we have to go to the spherical case. Right. Yeah. So, okay. So, well, just uh, one remark. So B B zero of K is also the Euler characteristic, right? So if K is the empty set, then the Euler characteristic is zero, and it's one. Um, okay, it's not empty because it's coming here. Yeah. Uh, 
so usually V0 is the set of um, two distinct points, and usually this, it has more points only than two. Is that not correct in this case? Or, um, no, why is it two? Uh, because it's got two distinct points. No, no, it's, it's a Euclidean case. It's not a spherical case. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. In the case. All right, so I, now, now let's look at some properties which are really, well, some are obvious, some are not so obvious at all. So first of all, one that is not obvious at all is it's that if you consider a convex body in Rn, or if you consider it as a convex body in a higher dimensional space, uh, this doesn't change the intrinsic volumes. And this is, well, it's, it's, it's not obvious, but it's the way we chose the um, normalizing constants here. And in fact, there were, um, before, um, before uh, um, this definition was found, there were some other uh, normalizations, and this gave rise to the quermas mass integrals and stuff like that. So this is really, it's, but it's a very nice property. Right. And another, so this is really obvious. Vj is invariant under nuclear motions. We are only looking at tubes and volume of tubes. This is invariant under nuclear motions. So also the Vj are invariant under nuclear motions. And so another, property which is uh, not obvious, well, it's not that obvious, that Vj is continuous. And I should probably say something about the Hausdorff metric. So the Hausdorff metric uh, defines a metric on the, on the set of convex bodies. Right? So, so how can you measure the distance between two convex bodies? So uh, one point is that, okay, let's, let's take uh, the convex body K, let's, um, so, so, so one way is to, to uh, let's take the, the smallest tube around K, which includes the set L, right? And let's call this uh, small r. And let's take at the same time this, uh, the, the tube around L, the smallest tube around L, which uh, includes the set K. Right? And this gives us S. And now the house of metric is defined as the maximum of these two, of these two uh, quantities. And it turns out that this gives us a metric on the set of um, uh, of uh, convex bodies in Rn. Right, so we have a matrix on, on the set of convex bodies, and Vj is now a continuous functional in this set. So this is a very, very important property. And now one property which is uh, sort of really essential is, is the following. So it's, assume that we have two convex bodies K and L, such that the union of these two bodies is again convex. So for most of com most convex bodies, this will not be the case, but Think of this maybe like this. So uh, let's say that we have the convex body K here, and L would be this one. Then the union will again be convex, right? Okay, this is. So we have K and L, and the union of this is again convex. But then we have a, a nice. Uh, nice formula for, for the intrinsic volumes of the union of these two. It says that it's just the, the sum of the intrinsic volume of, of the two parts minus the volumes of the intersection. Right. And this is actually what one, one usually attributes uh, to be a um, variation. So let's make the following different uh, definition. Uh, mu, uh, which is just a map from the set of convex bodies to R, is called the variation. If on the empty set it's uh, zero, and it satisfies this uh, addition formula. Right. So in, well, all these definitions that I've given you before, it, was, it seems some, in, in some way arbitrary, right? So we look at tubes, at volume of tubes, but what about this? So, but there's a very nice characterization theorem of Hartwiger, which says that these uh, intrinsic volumes are exactly the continuous and invariant variations. So the theorem reads the following way. If mu is a variation, which is at the same time continuous with respect to the uh, house of metric, of course, and invariant under Euclidean motions, then it must be of the form uh, linear combination of the intrinsic volumes. So in this sense, it, it says that our definition of the intrinsic volumes is uh, in no way arbitrary. It's just, well, it gives us all the valuations which are continuous and invariant. Say again? What is a Euclidean motion? Well, Euclidean motion uh, is a, well, it's a translation and a rotation. And rotation. Um, and when you were a here, are you referring to the algebra of convex sets or convex bodies or just? Just a set of convex bodies okay. as a metric. So you have an extent of that too. 
No, no, no. But I mean, so this is uh, Gomez expansion theorem. So if you, if you have, so okay, you could well, we have the set of complex bodies, but you could also look at um, um, uh, finite finite unions of complex bodies, right? So let's uh, and this is what it's called the the, um, uh, the convex ring for for some reason it's not a ring but it's called the convex ring. So we have finite unions of um, convex sets, and now we can take this addition property to actually extend this variation to uh, the, 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 um, the convex ring, just by definition. And it turns out that if you have such a continuous variation, then we can always extend this variation to the convex ring, and uh, this gives us um, a general evaluation. So in other words, what this is saying is that the um, set of valuations forms a linear space. Right. Finite dimensional space. Finite dimensional space. Yeah, you have the basis. And uh, so, so V0 in this sense is, then gives us just the euler characteristic. I mean, it's euler characteristic is trivial on the set of convex bodies because, I mean, the convex set always has you know, one, but, but for, for modern sets. Yeah. Okay. Right, so, yeah, I think this was all for, for the Euclidean case, but now we want to go to the spherical case. And why do we want to consider the spherical case? I, I mean, uh, the, the point is, it was just a question. The point is that if you want to consider um, convex cones and stuff like that, then it doesn't fit into the classical uh, theory of, of um, convex bodies because it, it's not convex, right? But what we can do is we can always um, take a convex set and then intersect it with the unit sphere, right? And then we get something like this. And you see, it's it's well, it's the same picture. You can go from from uh, up here down there by just intersecting it, and you can also go back by just you know taking the cone. Uh, describe any sets, and this way, um, uh, and this way, you you get to the to the spherical case. Okay, so yeah, and now we can now we want to talk about the spherical intrinsic volumes. So yeah, for this we first define what what we understand under a convex set. So we can define a convex set in the in the unit sphere by saying, okay, if I take the cone defined by this uh, spherical, convex, uh, spherical set, right? the cone defined in this way, then this should be convex. And we take this as a definition for, um, for convexity in the unit sphere. So in particular, if you take K to be a, a, a subsphere, right? uh, so, so the cone, if the cone itself is a, is a linear space, then this is uh, a convex set, and then in particular subspheres would be would be a spherical convex set. Okay, and for convenience, we also define the, the empty set to be convex, just to, you know, and we define the quantification of this empty set to be the set just the setting of the, the origin point. And, uh, right, some more notation. We, we uh, define the set of closed convex sets by this paragraphic K of S minus 1. And well, we need to consider some metric on the unit sphere, and we chose to, to consider the um, angular metric, right? So if you have two points P and Q, then we just take the, the angle formed by this uh, two points on the unit sphere. Well, and of course, a very important um, notion is the, is the notion of a tube, and you see here this is just the same as before, but now we've replaced the Euclidean distance by the spherical distance. Right? So, so a spherical tube is now just uh, yeah, we get to a picture. I, I think it's. I don't know. It's, what? Sorry, I think about it. Yeah, sure. So you're defining that with respect to the um, uh, angular metric on the screen. Right, right, right. I mean, we could have used a, a different basis, <coughs> but uh, I think this is the most natural one. Yeah, this is the most natural one. I would say. In some cases, it's. it's more convenient to take the tangent or tangent squared of that, but uh, it depends on the situation. It's easiest to, to work. So you're really thinking about this. So alpha is an angle. Yeah. Okay. So now we have this uh, set of convex set, paragraph K, and we have again a metric on this, well defined in the same way, in just the, the, the same way as in the Euclidean case. So if you have um, two convex sets, K1 and K2, then we take a tube around K1, well, the, the smallest tube which includes the uh, set K2, and the same for um, 
k2 into the k1. And then it, we take the maximum of these two. Right? And this again gives us a metric, which is called the Hausdorff metric again. And this, uh, well, this makes the set of uh, a spherical convex set a metric space. Okay. And a nice feature of this, uh, this is that uh, the set is actually compact. And just to understand this, could you explain why in the thing you have in the crab, why is pi over 2 not pi? Well, yeah, it's, well, I mean, it's, 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 it's the order, and it, it's a bit arbitrary, but it's, um, you will see later why I chose pi half. Okay. Uh, so it's, I mean, the empty set is basically one, one uh, single component, so we could have used any other definition, but it's very convenient to take by half, uh, you will see it in the next slide. So, oh no, you can. Yeah. Does, uh, because the maximum house floor distance you can have is pi. Right, right. So, so uh, just let's go to this picture. So, uh, okay, I get to this later. But, uh, oh, if you talk about later. Uh, okay. Yes. What about you? Does it have to do with loud? Or is it, is it, is it just uh, no, no, it's just, just convenience. Uh, because it's. <laughs> okay, so so, but okay. Let, let me also do, make this remark because it's really essential. Because I mean, let, let's let's define the set of uh, closed convex cones to be paragraphic C of R n. Then we have bijection between this set of uh, spherical convex set and the set of closed convex cones. And this is what we're actually interested in. So we want to uh, you know we want to work with a, a cone of positive semi different matrices and stuff like this. And so this just tells us that. Well, we actually can use with this in, in the sphere. And so the sphere is really uh, nice because here we have a natural uh, notion of distance, just the spherical distance and the house of distance, and this makes the whole theory go really nice. And okay, now we have some specific subsets of, of spherical common sense. Right. So right, what do I understand on the, of k subspheres of Sn minus 1? Right? So, uh, we have the unit sphere, but now we can intersect the unit sphere with the linear subspace. Right. The linear subspace, and if you intersect with the k plus one dimensional linear subs the subspace, then the intersection will be again a unit sphere, but now in a k plus one dimensional space, so the dimension of the subsphere will be k. Right. And so we define the minus one here to be the, the set just consisting of the empty set. Right. But then you have also those. Um, Convex sets which are not subspheres, and we call this the caps. Okay, C, C stands for caps. And the reason why I give this definition is, is the following picture, which is really nice to, to have in mind. That um, so this is the space of spherical convex sets, and in the Euclidean case, this this space is just one connected component because you can basically take every close uh, every convex body and just retract, retract it to some point, and then you know connect. With any other point, and this, so in the Euclidean case, this space really looks trivial. But in the spherical case, it decomposes in this way. So we have the component consisting only of the uh, empty set. So it's basically uh, the cone. Uh, well, where you only take the, 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 the trivial cone, and uh, so and then you have these uh, higher-dimensional linear subspheres, and these well, are going to the to the uh, to the conical viewpoint. So considering this uh, as cones, we basically get, we get here the Grassmann manifolds. So what's the Grassmann manifold? It's just, say, GR and N is just a set of n-dimensional subspaces, linear subspaces. Right. And, uh, well, and this is, uh, these are manifolds, and these are very nice structures. So we have basically here the, the Grassmann manifolds, and then here we have all the bunch, all, all, the, all the remaining uh, convex cones. Not to get you to your questions, it turns out that all these uh, uh, um, uh, all these house of distances between these components are always pi half. Right? If you have a if you have a two by um, say if you have a uh, right. now this is so if you have like in, in a two sphere and then you have a two dimensional subsphere and then you have say uh, a one dimensional subsphere which is just uh, consists of two points, right? Then oops, what happened now? Okay. 
So in order to, so now we, we, we need to take a tube around these two points to, to include this uh, two-dimensional subsphere. And the, the only way is to, to really get the uh, pi half dimensional tube, which is actually the whole sphere, to, to really capture this two-dimensional sphere. And this holds for every dimension. And so this doesn't depend on where those two points are. No, no. no. This is just a dimension argument. It's really easy to show. Just think of it in, in terms of, of uh, linear manifolds, and then okay. So you basically need to, to look at the yeah. This this is why we actually chose to define this via pi half. So this makes this all fit together. Okay, well, I really like this picture because it really shows that we really get something different compared to the GM case. And it's, uh, so your, your strip K, your strip C is whatever is left over. There. Right. So these are, like, in, in this component are the, the you know, interesting cases. The positive off and the kind of positive similar dimensions. They are all contained in this component. Yeah. So these are not necessarily spherical caps, they're just uh, caps. Right. Yeah, so they're not complex. And by by greater than equal to I add everything really is. Elementwise. Elementwise. So you, you can have yeah. Okay. Now let's let's look again at two forms. So yeah, I want to yeah. so going back to what you said. So your pi over two was not arbitrary then, given what you just described, right? No, no, it's, it's not arbitrary. It's just that. Okay. So so now we want to define the intrinsic volumes, and for this we need to look at the tubes, right? Tubes of now spherical convex sets. And okay, let's have a look at an example. Let's look at the three-dimensional positive orthon. And so in the second group units here we get this nice uh, green uh, set. So in here it is again. And so now a tube around the set looks like this. Right? Now we can do the same thing uh, as before, and then uh, decompose this. Uh, as we did before, and now we see that here, okay, this part that is not shown right now, it's just the spherical volume, and now we have some other parts. So this is basically linear, and these parts are basically uh, quadratic, right? And if you put these together, then you see that it, it's not as in the Ewing case. So you don't get the full cap here, and, and you also see that this is not exactly linear, right? But, uh, well, what is this? This is actually, um, part of a, a one-dimensional, so it, it's part of a, a one-dimensional subsphere, right? So instead of um, taking the, the, the monom monomials uh, R to the J, we, we basically have to replace monomials by uh, volumes of tubes around subspheres. And this is the right thing to, to actually define this intrinsic volumes. Okay, here's the formal definition. Uh, actually, it's, it's more a proposition. So um, if you take a spherical convex set, and well, alpha between zero and pi half. And then we consider the tube uh, around k of radius pi half and take the volume of it. Then, well, we get the volume again, and then we get some um, polynomial looking like um, uh, well, uh, summit. And <coughs> well, here you see that now the monomials are replaced by the volume of a j dimensional tube uh, around the norm. Tube of a j dimensional. Uh, subsphere in a sense, and yeah, and what, well, and what, what's, well, what's the order of this term is well, uh, the uh, tube has dimension, uh, the, the subsphere has dimension j, so uh, it should be of order of co-dimension of j, and the co-dimension of j is m minus one minus j. So these are basically you can think of this as alpha to the n minus one minus j, and then it gets formal for a moment, but it's not well, it's not correct, but it's asymptotically right. Yeah, and the induced function is now called the intrinsic volume, yeah, the spherical intrinsic volume. Yeah. Okay, so I ask you about the factor of uh, two again. You're you're only integrating over sort of outward when you when you're looking at this two formula, um, but a two around a subspace is going to have two sides on it. So right. do you take that into your definition of this volume? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's a, a factor of two that. that right. Okay. Here. So so if you took uh, if you look at the so the, the m a minus first intrinsic volume. Okay, this is not. So, but v n minus two is now the volume of a um, of an n minus two dimensional subsphere. Uh, subsphere, and so the the, the n minus two intrinsic volume would be um, 
one half the volume of the boundary of the chip. So this is where the, the one half comes in. So I guess I'm going to ask a question. Yeah. So this is now consistent with the definition we gave earlier. Right. Okay. So is this is easy to show. This it's, it's it's not hard it's because I mean you only have to look at the uh, as as before you can see it in this picture if you, if you take the tube then you can basically decompose the tube uh, by projecting it on on, on the subsphere uh, on on the subsphere or on on the subs uh, on, on in other words I guess what you have below has to somehow map to so these are the points when you project on to say your polyhedral cone with a billion dimension right? two yeah right. I, you have to check this. Oh, of course, I mean you have to prove this. Right. It's not. It, it's not too hard. So it's, right. and, okay. This is now for for, for the uh, spherical case. Now it turns out that if you go for, from the spherical um, from the spherical situation to cones, it, it's nice to have a shift in the uh, in the indices. So if you have a closed convex cone now, then we have this. Uh, we define this here uh, shift of index. Why do we do this? Well, if you do, uh, when we do it this way, then the index somehow represents the dimension, right? If, you have, uh, if you're talking about a spherical convex set, then it's one dimension less than, than, than the cone because the intersecting with the unit sphere drops the dimension by one. Right? And, well, and then we define the Vn of C by taking the um, Volume of the uh, so here should be a bracket so taking the relative volume of the intersection of the cone is a uh, subsphere. Right? Okay. So now this seems to be a little arbitrary, but so here's uh, what you asked for. Now this is actually a proposition to show that if C is a polyhedral cone, then we get exactly what we have seen before. Uh, so so this was uh, what I was showing before the, the characterization, but this is now a proposition of this definition that we've given in terms of the uh, volume of tubes. And now here you see why this is actually uh, very nice because there, uh, well, this way we can get this also, it's, it's nice in composition of the units. So I'm a little puzzled by why you said, you know, this definition doesn't extend to non polyhedral cones. If I have, say, positive semi definite matrices, I can still define a projection and look at the probability that if I take a point and I project on yeah, that's true, but um, so what is the problem? The, the, the problem is that um, too low. Sorry, I mean, oh, too big. You, you can do this, but then you get you won't get the right definition because I mean, of course you can you can look, you, you can look at the faces and and then decompose uh, 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 only a non braided uh, sets in terms of faces. Uh, I mean, that's true, but. Um, I think the problem is that you're going to the limit. If you had had a polyhedral cone, it would you be... You can approximate this. You would, have a two you would always be hitting and these two-dimensional regions, but yeah. now you... And maybe, uh, think of it in, in terms of... Uh, so think of a smooth boundary, right? right? If you have a smooth boundary, then, then all faces are one-dimensional. And this way, you would lose all the information. Right? And basically, if you look at a smooth uh, set, then you look at the curvature. This is what you get. And, right, so, so for, for non linear cones, this is, uh, well, you don't get this nice formulation, but, but you still can cover this uh, with, the, with the volume of the tube. So this is a nice way to actually define this. And, uh, yeah. So, so yes. when, you, when you mention the curvature right now, can you actually reconstruct a probabilistic interpretation through that, or? Yeah, you can. And I will show this uh, later on, when we talk about smooth cones, yeah. Okay, right. So, but now let's look at some properties of these uh, intrinsic volumes. So again, uh, so this is now, well, uh, it's, 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 it's again a very important property, but um, it looks quite innocent. So if you consider a cone C as a cone in, uh, in a higher dimensional space, then it doesn't change the intrinsic volumes. You know, think of it in terms of the, uh, well, for polyhedral cones, it's very easy to, to show because uh, if, if you look at the projection, then, uh, the the the, um, the high dimensional part doesn't contribute or doesn't change the probabilities anyway. So but this is a very important property. And well, this is again trivial. So Vija is invariant under the Van der Broek because well, basically look at volumes and everything. And uh, Vija is continuous. This is again not trivial, but it's, it's also not too hard to show. 
And so this now renewals property that we have again this additivity, just as in the Euclidean case. Right. Okay, but now just warning because in, in the Euclidean case uh, we had this nice characterization uh, theorem of Hartwig, which said that the intrinsic ones are all uh, all the continuous invariant uh, variations, but for the straight case we don't have this for any uh, greater than four. So here yeah, I say that no direct and that of this theorem is known. There are, uh, there are some, so, um, okay, we, we have talked about intrinsic volumes, but you can also look at certain localization of this, and I will talk about this in the second talk. And for these localizations, we actually have this characterization theory. But, um, but as I said, so I think the general uh, agreement is that it's probably true, I think, a theorem, but nobody can, uh, uh, nobody has a proof of it. Yes, so, so this is sort of, I mean, it's really um, different, um, different setting than the Euclidean case. So your property of four, again, I'm, going to, yeah. I'm sorry to keep on talking here about probability of cons. Labor probabilities, and so this is just, you know, law of probability. That you're going to get, right? And so in the, Probably, yes, yes. in, in, in the non-polyhedral case, can these be viewed as probabilities, or do they sum them up? I think, Basically, I think the, 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 the basic uh, way to prove this is to look at the volume of the tubes and then no, the volume. Yeah. That's what I'm asking. So these VJs add up to one? Right. In the general case, they do? Yes, yes. And this is true because we have the continuity, right? And, well, we, we have the space of spherical convex sets and the space of polyhedral spherical sets is dense. Right. So every property that we've shown before for the polyhedral for case now extends for, for, the, for the general case. But then I'm confused with what was going on there. So then I should be able to view these things again as probabilities that if I mm -hmm. choose a random point that they mm -hmm. fall on a particular dimension. No, no, no. no. Right. Because what you're saying by continuous. No, it's because the dimension is not continuous, right? The dimension of the phase. Right. If you if you if well if you if you think about a smooth code, right, mm -hmm. then you only have one dimensional phase, but right. if you if you approximate it by a polyhedral set, then this is still true. Okay, but yeah, so but as you said, um, no, but I was still concerned. So if, if you approximate, you're saying the VJs are continuous, right? Yes. So even though all, I, I agree with the dimensions that all hell breaks loose in terms of how the faces are and how I'm, I'm approximating this, but yeah. my VJs should not change a whole lot. Right? No, no, the VJs are continuous. Right, so that's, that's right. That's right. But you said uh, that you can in interpret the intrinsic volumes for, for a general cone in terms of this. You know, take a random point and project it. Right. But this doesn't work because the dimension is not continuous. So, so this, this phase decomposition is not continuous. This breaks down. But the VJs itself, they, they are continuous. Okay, but <laughs> maybe we just, just go on. Um, so, uh, as I said, the, the fact that they add up to one, this also extends now to the general case. And by the way, we can interpret this in, in terms of the, the uh, volume polynomial by just uh, you know evaluating that the volume polynomial is one. Uh, is one. And so this is a very non-trivial property, but which is also true if uh, C is not a linear subspace. So if we are you know if you uh, think of it in terms of this decomposition of the set of circle, like I said, if you are in this uh, lower part, then we have this nice uh, property that if you only take the even intrinsic volumes and add these up, then you get one half. And this is by no means easy to see it. It follows from the um, gauss bonnet theorem, I, I guess. But it's, it's, very, it's a non-trivial effect. And well, this in particular means that if you, if you add up the, the uh, odd parts, then you also get one half. Right. And, uh, right. and for, well, for linear subspaces, then this is just the uh, 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 one of the j is the dimension of w and, and zero. So if you think of it in terms of the volume polynomial, then you just get a single monomial for all linear subspaces. Okay, and now we have this, this nice duality uh, theorem which says that if we go from from a cone C to the dual cone, then well, then the uh, intrinsic volume is just reverse. So, so the zero intrinsic volume 
it was just the volume of the, of the dual is now, the, the dual of the dual is again the primal code, and so, um, yeah, but this holds also for, for all the other intrinsic volumes. So we have a very nice duality uh, relation here with intrinsic volumes also. Um, all right, so some examples. So before we have seen the, the positive orphan, but uh, you know, we don't have that many nice examples. So uh, just to give you a, a few more, which I thought I found uh, last year, but actually I uh, recently found out that uh, these two guys have proved it uh, two years before me. Anyway, but uh, okay, let's look at these uh, codes, right? So CA is now the codes of uh, ordered uh, uh, order components, and CB is now the sort of positive order, order, order components, and CD. Well, this looks a bit odd, but you know, it's, it's, if you can extend this to the left by saying so it's greater, greater equal to minus x2, but minus x2 is also greater equal than uh, minus x3, and so on, and then it gets a little more symmetric. And uh, so for, for, for these cones, we can also give a uh, very nice uh, formula for the intrinsic volumes. And it turns out that these are best formulated in terms of the volume polynomial. And then maybe we only uh, should look at uh, the cone CA uh, order terms. So what's, what's uh, the polynomial? It's basically, well, it's x times x plus 1 times x plus 2 times x plus 3 and so on. Divided by n factorial, and maybe some of you will recognize this as the Stirling numbers. So this is actually quite a nice example that the intrinsic volumes actually turn out to be some, some well-known uh, quantities uh, that appear in, in, in combinatorics. Uh, so these are just uh, well, the Stirling numbers divided by n factorial of course. They have to add up to one. So it's interpretation of the result. Interpretation of what? Of the result C is Well, uh, so the way they appear is that they are um, chambers of finite reflection loops. So if you if you think of um, uh, mirrors in Euclidean space, right, then this gives you a, a, sub, a subgroup of the orthogonal group, and then you can ask about the, the, the finite reflection groups. Right? And the finite reflection groups have, have, have been classified. If you basically have these three families, then there are some exceptional cases, but so these are well, these are the infinite families for finite reflection groups. There's some two-dimensional case also. Um, and so this, uh, yeah, I don't have any application for this yet, but uh, we don't have so many examples where this nice one is. Yeah. Just thought it's Will nice. you show us how you compute any of this? Like, well, it's, um, no, uh, it's, it's basically, um, so the way I uh, uh, proved it was uh, using the, um, the additivity. So the um, uh, you, you have um, basically this finite reflection group. So, so if you if you take the union of uh, a few of them, then you get you know uh, well it, it somehow you, you you get a recurrence formula, and then if you solve the re recurrence formula, then, then you get the Stirling numbers. They proved it in a, in a much different way. They use really the, the, the theory of finite reflection groups, but just wanted to show these examples to the, give you just an idea of, of the intrinsic. But we come to to a more um, more useful example in, uh, in the next slides. And uh, right, so uh, as if asked, so so I, I want to give you this uh, uh, nice little uh, application for this. I need to look at uh, spherical cones. And spherical cones are not polyhedral; they are smooth cones, right? They have a smooth boundary. And for this, we need to have a look at uh, smooth cones. So what I mean by that? So um, what? Well, C, uh, let's say C is a closed convex cone, K is in the section of the unit sphere, and now we take M to be the boundary of this spherical set. Right? And now we say that, that C is a smooth cone if this uh, boundary is a smooth submanifold, quarter dimension one. Right? So, so you should have this picture. Uh, right? So now you have this three dimensional cone here, then you have this. Uh, K is now the intersection of C with the, with the unit sphere, and now M would be boundary of K. And now this should be a, a smooth set. Right. And okay, now uh, um, also a classical formula of uh, Hermann Weyl is, is the following. So it looks 
uh, a little bit complicated, but it's, it's not so complicated. So what does it say? So it says that if we have a smooth cone C, then we can, uh, well, for J from uh, 1 to n minus 1, we can write the intrinsic volume in the following way. So we have some normalizing constants, and then we have some integral of the boundary. Right? Now what we have here is, um, well, this sigma is uh, basically the elementary symmetric functions. And so these kappa 1 to kappa n minus 1 are the principal curvatures of this element. I will explain just, uh, if, well, on the next slide I will explain what the principal curvatures are. But this is just to, 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 uh, to motivate this. So this actually gives us an explicit formula for the intrinsic volumes of uh, cones with a uh, smooth boundary. Right. And so, well, it, well, explicit formula in, in the case that we only know, need to know the uh, principal curvatures, and then we have to integrate uh, the elementary symmetric function of these curvatures over the boundary. Uh, and this way, the well, curvature really enters the intrinsic volume. Okay, now what are the pr principal curvatures? So, um, so this is a picture here. So k is our spherical convex set, um, and m is the boundary. And if you have a point p uh, in the boundary, then we have uh, a normal vector point pointing out. Okay. So we have here the, the, the tangent space, right? Tangent space just touching the uh, set k, and we have well, we have one-dimensional no uh, normal space because we assume that we have co-dimension one. And well, now we can define u to be the unit, the, the unit normal vector pointing outside the set. This is happening in the sphere. In the sphere, yes. 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 I mean, you can think about it. It doesn't matter. Color, but, uh, yeah. Right. And well, now uh, this new, this is also called the Gauss map. This is a, a smooth map. And uh, well, and now we can look at the uh, derivative of this map. Right. Okay. For this, we, we need to make some identification. So we're looking at the tangent space of this um, circle convex at M. But well, we think about the unit sphere as embedded in Euclidean space. So we can also uh, always con uh, um, uh, we can always uh, consider this as actually uh, being um, linear subspaces of the Euclidean space defined by P and uh, the normal vector. And then the derivative turns out to be a map from the tangent space to the tangent space. So this is something that uh, I need to show, but this actually turns out to be true. And on that, it is self-adjoint. Right? So it's a self-adjoint linear operator. And now the convexity of the set K. So remember that M is the boundary of a convex set. And convexity implies that it's actually a positive semi-definite uh, semi linear operator. For every point on the boundary, it, well, this makes sense because convexity. If you, if you have like a convex curve, then you uh, say the convexity is the second derivative should be should be uh, positive or not negative, and this is exactly like this is exactly this. And well, now the eigenvalues of this uh, linear operator. These are the uh, the, the principal curvatures of M at this point. Okay, this this way uh, in, in this way we get an explicit formula for the intrinsic world of, of smooth cones. So now we have two extremes. We have polyhedral cones on one side and smooth cones on the other side. So guys, the, 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 your previous formula says that your DJs are in the coefficients of the characteristic polynomial. Right. Yeah. You can. Well, uh, you, you you get this concept uh, uh, also. Um, right. So now let, let's look at the uh, example that I would uh, set up. <coughs> so we have uh, um, uh, a circular cone. Right. So a circular cone is now uh, a smooth cone. So, so what is the circular cone? It's just well, you can find it this way, um, but you can also think of it in terms that you take a point on the unit sphere and then you take a spherical ball around this point and then you take the corresponding cone. And well. Now, well, this is a, a ball in, in the unit sphere, and uh, the unit sphere has constant curvature itself, and well, it turns out that uh, the boundary has constant curvature everywhere, which makes sense if you think about it in the Euclidean case. And the curvature, if you want to compute it, 
it's actually the, the, the cotangent of the of the uh, of the angle. Right? Okay, let, let's uh, look at the, look at the extreme cases. If you have uh, if you let alpha go to zero, then well, what do you get? And this actually goes to goes to a point, right? And well, for, for small alpha, it should be uh, there shouldn't be too much difference between the, 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 the spherical setting and, and the Euclidean setting. And so you see, uh, for small alpha, this is basically one over alpha. It makes sense, right? So just the Euclidean case. And if you get that alpha go to pi half, right? Then we go to a, a, a half sphere, uh, no, not a half. Well, the the the, the, uh, the circular cone is a half sphere, but the boundary is just a, a subsphere, and the subsphere has well no. Uh, no curvature relative to the unit sphere, and this also makes sense because this goes to zero. Right? Right. Tangent goes to infinity and cotangent goes. And uh, yeah. so that's it. And now we only have to plug it in into our nice little formula. Then you know take the integral over the um, over the boundary, but the boundary is now well, it's just a, a, a shrink uh, circle. So so you can simplify this, and what you get is a following nice formula. Uh, which says that the J is the volume of this circular cone has the following form. So it's basically a binomial coefficient. Well, it's, it's basically, sorry, let's uh, look at it this way. So let's define S to be the sine square of alpha. And now, if you look at this uh, from a broad view, then you basically get the uh, binomial distribution. Right? So you get the binomial distribution. Uh, so, so binomial distribution with n minus two half uh, draws, well, of j minus one half, and then with prob probability of success of sine square of alpha. I mean, right? So, so n and well, n could be an odd number, but um, so maybe you should just uh, think of it that n being even and j being odd, and then you only get the integers here. Otherwise, we do well. You have to extend it to to uh, half integers, but this is. Um, uh, this is no problem. Okay, so this holds for j uh, from 1 to n minus 1. For 0 and n, it, it's not exactly the same formula, but uh, okay, let's, let's not consider the extreme cases because um, they're easy to have. So what you should take from this is that uh, you actually get, for circular cones, again, the binomial distribution, but now not the symmetric binomial distribution, but well, the probability of success is now sine square of 1. Okay, now, okay, before we can uh, actually go to the application, I should um, say just a few words on the kinematic formulas. We, we will um, have uh, the second talk on the kinematic form in a much broader uh, view, but, but just a few words on this. So, what are the kinematic formulas? Sorry? Your last formula, so the fact that you get this doesn't, so if I looked at the polynomial, it wouldn't have been something to some power. No, no, because the because it's are different, right? Because of the one half. Right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, but there's no interpretation of this. Not that I know. Okay, but so what are the kinematic formulas? First of all, I should say who's invented them or found them. It was basically uh, the work of Blaschke, Chern, Hartwig, Santalo, and there are many generalizations. So I would just you know, take out uh, one specific form uh, uh, in this first talk. And the general idea is the following. So the general idea is take two objects, like take two convex bodies, and then you make the following, you, you, you uh, well, say, take uh, one fixed, and then the other take a, a random, say, a random nuclear motion, right? And so, right, and so um, now you look at the intersection of these uh, well, of these two objects that you have, and now, um, now you can ask, okay, what, what's the expected volume of this intersection? Right? Or you can also ask, well, what's what's the J's intrinsic volume of this intersection? And it turns out that uh, this this question can be uh, can be answered in, 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 terms of, in terms of the intrinsic volume of the two objects itself. And well, this is what the kinematic formulas are. So basically, just to repeat this, you, you take two objects, then you move them randomly around, then you take the intersection, or uh, let's, uh, and then you ask what, what's the expectation of this, of this, uh, this random intersection. 
Okay, just one example. I mean, you, you can ask about the expected volume, but you can also ask what's the probability that they intersect at all. Right? And that's the form that I would like to present here in this first one. So if you take a convex cap k in Sn and you take a, a uniform random subsphere, so now k is fixed and S is sort of like a random subs subsphere, say of co dimension C. So C is the co dimension of the, of the subsphere. Right? And then you ask, What's the probability that, well, the intersection of, of, the, uh, of this fixed uh, set K and this random subsphere, uh, what's the probability that this is non empty, non empty intersection? Well, and this just says that, well, just look at the um, intrinsic volumes starting at the co dimension of C. Now, C is the cone um, defined by K. And then take, uh, well, C plus 2, C plus 4, add them all up, and two times this. This gives the probability that the intersection is not We will see in the second talk, uh, well, this is now a bit arbitrary again, but in the second talk, uh, I'll give you a very nice way to, to re look at these uh, kinematic formulas. And it turns out that in the spherical case, there's really, uh, in the heart of all these formulas, so there are different versions of this, right? In, in the Euclidean case, there's really uh, a lot around it. I really, uh, it's really hard to, to get an overview of what is really known about this. In the spherical case, basically we have one formula from this, from which you can derive all kinds of, uh, um, of specifications. But this will be part of the second talk. So this is just uh, you know first impression. I will use this to show this nice application. So grass when I go. Say yeah, yeah. The, the, the uniform. So so basically take a you can think about it as uh, taking a, a Gaussian matrix and then the subspace. As for the grass line, or this formula we add up all the volumes of the faces, I guess this is the general position of that. Um, anyway. It is. It is. And convex cap doesn't mean a spherical cap. Or do you mean a spherical cap? Oh, yes, yeah, of course. So then, but then that's, okay, but then that's it's kind of overdetermined. I mean, there's only, oh, I guess we have the size of the cap to consider here, and, that, and you're saying that it scales as this formula. No, that's valid for any. Any convex, any, any convex, convex, not just spherical, not just a, uh, yeah. It's, it's a spherical convex cap. Uh, maybe I'm using the terms wrong. Right. It, it's spherical. Oh, no, 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 not circular, not sorry. It's not circular, yeah. No just, circular. It could look like anything as long. Yeah, yeah any convex. Actually, good, yeah. that makes sense. Okay. Right, but now let's finally get to, to this nice uh, uh, application that I promised you. Okay, maybe you felt the saying that in higher dimension, if you, if you took, uh, if you look at the uh, mass of the unit sphere, and you basically look, look at the subsphere of co-dimension one. Then all the all the mass of the unit sphere is concentrated around a strip of a, of, a, of this of this hypersphere. And no matter how small the the, the, the the strip around the subsphere actually is. Maybe you've heard about this, but maybe not. But what does it mean formally? So it, this the saying is uh, is formally the following. So let's pick a an epsilon greater than zero can be as small as, uh, as you wish. And then you look at the, the relative volume of the tube around the uh, hypersphere. So, so S index N is now a subsphere of core dimension 1. Right? And so this relative volume always goes to 1 if you let N go to infinity. This is just a formal statement of this, of this saying that you may have. OK, now the question is, so this holds for core dimension 1. Right? So what if I replace 1 by 2 uh, or 4? So, so what happens if I let the co-dimension be um, a ratio of, of the dimension itself? Right? And so this is, this is not the question. What happens when the co-dimension is proportional to the dimension? And this is what we will now answer. And uh, so first of all, what does it mean formally? So again, let's, let's take an epsilon greater than 0. And now let's take a C uh, in 0, 1. And now we, we take S. S index n to be a subsphere, but what's the dimension of the subsphere? Well, let's say that the co-dimension is cn. And now we want to be the co the co-dimension to be proportional to n. This means that if we take the uh, ratio cn divided by n, then this should go to uh, this ratio c that we've chosen before. Now the question is, what happens with the relative volume of the tube around this uh, around this subsphere if we let n go to infinity? Now you can answer this. So let's just try to reformulate this uh, uh, relative volume. 
what, what does it mean? So this is the relative volume of a, of a tube around the sphere. So we can form it in this way. Say that you take a, a pick a point randomly on the unit sphere, uniformly random, and then you ask about the probability that this point lies in the tube around this uh, subsphere. This is relative formulation. But now, okay, now we, we take the tube around the subsphere and we take the point. Well, we can we can uh, reform it in the following way by saying, okay, let's not take the tube around the subsphere, but let's take the tube around the point P. Right? So then we get this picture. So and then you ask about the probability that the, the tube around uh, the ball around the point P intersects the unit sphere. Not sure. Right? And well, so now here at this point we take the point P uniform at random, but we can also say, okay, let's let's take the point P fixed and let's take the subsphere uniform at random. Right? This doesn't change the probability, but this is just the setting of our kinematic formula. So this is a convex set, and now we ask about the intersection with the, with the subsphere to be non-trivial. And the kinematic formula says that well, you can write this in terms of the intrinsic worms. But now, what do we have here? So these are intrinsic worms of circular cones, right? And we've seen before that the intrinsic worm of circular cones is basically just the binomial distribution, right? And the binomial distribution, well, okay, so we get this. So, so now we get the sum of the, inter of, of the binomial distribution, and this is so what we get here is basically the, the commutative distribution function of this binomial distribution. Well, of the form probability with uh, great x is greater equal than little x, because we will be adding up uh, to the right. Okay, now the binomial distribution in, in high dimension looks very peaky, right? So uh, in high dimension, you basically get this vector. So it get a very sharp peak here, and so this is between 0 and n, and so all this is concentrated in the uh, expectation. And well, if, if, you, if you write this in terms of the C, then you will get the ratio of Cn divided by n. Okay, but now we've seen that the Cn divided by n goes to our little c, right? And so, so this probability that you see here that either goes to one if if, if we are uh, we are left from this from this uh, threshold, or it goes to zero if you're on the right. So this is just uh, you know one of the simplest. Uh, uh, the properties of, of the binomial distribution, and uh, so so what do we have? So the relative volume of this tube is either everything or nothing. So really get a very nice transition by just doing some simple reformulation of, of this probability and then applying the kinematic formula once. Right? Okay. So the conclusion is the following. So conclusion is that there is a threshold. So now interpreting it in, in terms of this uh, epsilon here, that the uh, relative form is either zero if we are epsilon is below this uh, threshold, and it's one if epsilon is above this threshold. Right? And the threshold is determined by the ratio in the form c equals sine square of tau. Okay, so right, so this is this is uh, now the conclusion when we make the tube around high dimensional subspheres either F, nothing or everything depends on, on this uh, very easy formula. And in particular, see if, if you replace a co-dimension one by co-dimension two or four, everything, it's, it's, it doesn't matter. But as soon as you get proportional to the dimension, it gets something different. And, and that's, I think that's enough for the first talk because say thank you at this point. Does this kind of theory let you say anything about three-way intersections? But what? Random three-way intersections, I take. Three-way intersections. Yeah, so, so well, I've talked about two random points, but you can also take three or four. Can we have a formula also cover these cases? You can work with this. So this uh, nothing, everything that you have here, um, I assume that the, the uh, above the, the line here is sort of exponentially small probability. Right, I mean, you can also give, uh, uh, I mean, everything is behind this, it's just uh, what the final resolution, I mean, but this is... It's a, ex yeah. sort of an exponential change. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very sharp condition. More questions? So you're just in your comment to Leonard's question. Um, how, can, how does the kinematic formula apply to the three? Well, um, it's probably best to do it. It's, it's, um, 
Yeah, so, so what you basically get here, you, you basically, what, what's behind all this is if you, if you take the uh, intersection of two random uh, circuit sets, then you basically look at the convolution of the intrinsic equations. And for, for three, then you take the uh, convolution of these uh, three intrinsic volumes. But uh, so if the kinematic formula had one volume and it had a subspace. Right, but yeah, you could, yeah, for, for a subspace, right. So, but so this, this is, is just a special case. I understand. So I, I assume a generalization if you have two complex volumes. Right, right. And, um, and even more uh, generalization would be to, to take, say, k complex bodies. And there are also kinematic forms to that describe the intrinsic volume of, of the intersection of, say, k. But, uh, okay, so I should add that you, you need to take the intersection to, to stay in the convex domain. So as soon as you leave convexity world, it's sort of, I mean, it's, you cannot, so if, if you ask about, uh, say, take the union or something, uh -huh. then it's a completely different story. So you can't tell me, so I've taken the intersection of three of these, <coughs> And now I've got eight pieces. I've got the intersection and I've got seven other pieces. And you can't tell me about the volumes of the different pieces of that Venn diagram. No, this is a, this is a different story. Because you need to look at the complement and, and yeah, okay. this is a different story. Yeah. Although, you, you mentioned before that there are also um, at least in the Euclidean case, kinematic formulas for other kinds of intrinsic volumes. So you can imagine that yeah, so, but, but in the Euclidean case, you, you always, I mean, um, well, in, in the stricter case, let's put it this way, in the stricter case, you just get the convolution of, of say, two, two sets of intrinsic volumes. But in the, in the Euclidean case, you always get a certain normalization constants. So in the stricter case, it's, it's much cleaner, much cleaner um, theory behind. Well, I'm not sure what a random motion means in the Euclidean. Well, you, 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 you take, well, you, you basically, uh, like you take a, a orthogonal transformation, this is not a problem. But then you, you take, um, uh, I mean, if if you take the intersection of, of um, two convex bodies, then it's it's only uh, well, it's only not empty for 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 a compact set. So it's um, uh, so basically well, you need to take the, the unit <coughs> distribution, but. Um, I don't know. Isn't this usually conditioned on looking at a little window? Yeah, yeah, that's the point. You, you, yeah. you condition it. That you take the so you condition on, on, you condition on both of the bodies um, striking this uh, little window that you're looking at. So you're not really looking at the entire Euclidean space. You're normalizing out by the probability that you've... Okay, so you're, you're yeah. taking a larger larger and larger yeah. box and taking the limit and renormalizing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. I mean, this is the classical theory of um, integral geometry. That starting from the phone's um, needle problem um, and then grew into this entire beast. So the, the union of two convex sets is not convex. Can you say something about their convex hull? Um, like um, um, yeah, basically what you're doing is, uh, so, so the union of, of, the, of the convex hull is, if you, if you take the dual viewpoint, right? So if you have uh, two spherical convex set, then you can also look at the duals. And uh, the dual of, of taking the interior, uh, the, 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 the intersection is taking the convex hull of the union. So going back, so, so if, you, if you take the convex hull of the union, you basically take the intersection of the duals. And so in the spherical case, it's no problem. You just go to, to, to the dual viewpoint, and then this uh, convex hull of the union just gets intersection. And if, if you specialize to subspaces, then this basically gets a uh, projection uh, in terms of I, I would think you could go beyond things where there's a union. Yeah, where the, where the, where the union is. Um, I think you go beyond the case where the union is convex, given that the evaluation is satisfied with inclusion exclusion relationships. I'm going to use this to chop these formulas up into pieces, as Leonard was suggesting, or are you really just. Uh, so you. Um, you're suggesting uh, just take the union, not take a convex out of the union? For example. Yeah, I mean, the, the point is that because valuations are defined on this entire, at least in the equation, case you're defined on this polyconvex sets. And, right. And, um, so you can actually talk about sensibly about valuations of you know, very complicated sets. Right. Yeah. yeah that's a good point. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure if the kinematic formulas extend to the uh, to this case. They so probably not, but but uh, they, there are some kind of, there are some formulas for the strictly convex ring. 
but um, they're developed in, in Schneider and Lyle's work. Okay. Um, so maybe we can, we can talk about that afterwards, but there are some formulas. Right, but, yeah. but one has to be careful if you, if you as soon as you leave uh, you know, the set of comic sense, uh, we, there are some pitfalls. So for example, sure. just, just to, to, to mention, uh, I've mentioned this house of metric, but the house of metric is actually, if you think about you know, general sets, then it's a very weak, um, weak matrix, uh, metric. If you think about, say, think about the convex set, and now you take like, say, a single point, and you take uh, a huge number of, of single points, right? the union of these points, and then, uh, so, so you re recover your, your set if you take uh, enough points in, in terms of the, of the house of metric. Right? But if you take the, the volume of the you know, finitely many points, the volume is zero. So the volume is, if you, if you leave this con convex ring, uh, if you go to the convex ring, then, then the house of metric is a very weak thing. And, and the intrinsic volume are not uh, continuous at all. Right? So, so this is really uh, something you, you need to take care of. Yeah. One last yeah. Are your slides available? Uh, yeah, sure. I, I wanted to, to put them on. Uh, um, we'll make sure you get a copy of it. Um, okay, so let's wrap up for today. Um, Dennis will be speaking again tomorrow and on Thursday, um, same place, same time, um, on applications of some of these ideas and problems in complex geometry and optimization. So let's thank him and uh, see you again tomorrow.